So glad that you're here this morning. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to go through a couple verses here. I don't know how far we're going to get. I only got through the first verse, actually, in the first service. So, <laughs> But we're going to go through all four. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, no, you know, the fear is when I'm putting everything together is that I just don't have enough material, and then I'm up here going, um, um, um. <laughs> but that never happens. So, um I'm glad that the Lord is faithful in all that he does in our lives. So um, you can tell there the title of the message is In a Mere Dimly, and it's not anywhere in Colossians, that little phrase. So if you're confused, that's uh, it's okay because it is kind of confusing, right? <laughs> but that's the idea that we want to talk about this morning as... Um, as the Lord moves in our hearts, I pray that you will be encouraged this morning in whatever circumstance, wherever you find yourself right now in life, the things that are going on, that you would just see that the Lord is uh, in the midst of all of it. Um, <clears throat> Colossians 3, 1 through 4 is, it's really an awesome scripture, very uplifting, um, but it has kind of this uh, you know, it's hard to understand in some ways, and that's why I entitled this um, In a Mirror Dimly. Because in actuality, in actuality, we, um, and this is the verse that it comes from, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So, you know, there's this idea in our lives that, um, you know, we have this reality of the resurrection, right? We celebrated that the, a couple weeks, weekends ago. Um, I hope you, wherever you were at, you were able to do that. I mean, it's a beautiful and a glorious uh, celebration that we have, but actually it's not just one day, right? It's like every day we celebrate the resurrection because that's who we are. We're new creatures in Christ raised up with him. And that's what this passage talks about. But a lot of times we don't experience that, right? I mean, we're, we're not really living in that or we're not really necessarily experiencing that. We're in the Monday stage mundane Monday. Yeah, you can tell I'm looking forward to Monday, right? So we're in the mundane things of life, the standard things of life The we do over and over again, all of these things that we go through. And sometimes it's really hard to see the beautiful truth that God has given us and all that we have in Christ and all that we celebrated, you know, a couple of weeks ago, because this is the thing. We know the reality and we know the knowledge of what Christ has done for us, but we don't know fully the totality of what Christ has done for us. And so here we are, we're locked in this struggle at times, right? We're locked in this struggle of the mundane, the things that don't seem to, I mean, here I am on my computer, you know, all week long, sending emails back and forth, putting together PDFs. What in the world does this really matter? You know, when it really comes down to it. I mean, I was thinking this last week as I was stressed out about what's coming across my emails, right? I'm stressed out about it. And I'm going, what does this have to do with anything that I really know is true? Because I know the reality of what Jesus has done. I know who I am in Christ. I know that I'm a new creation. And yet I don't totally get it, right? We don't. We don't totally understand it. This passage really gives us an idea of, you know, we see the broad picture of this. And I think that that's what Paul's desire is when he wrote this down. Because really, he's summing up the things that he has already said in chapters 1 and chapter 2 of Colossians. And here we are entering into the practical side of the doctrine, the theology, all of the points that he had made within those uh, you know, within those chapters. And now here we come to a real practical place. I love how Paul has laid that out in this book. It's a beautiful book. Uh, Ephesians has that same kind of an idea. As you read through the book of Ephesians, you see that doctrine, you know, theology, these things about God. And then practically, how do you live those things out? So we're right at the cusp of that practical place. Well, I have a little story I want to tell you because it kind of gives... Um, I think, a little picture of what we're talking about here this morning. This reality that we know, but really we don't understand the totality of it all. Um, several years back uh, with my son and Jesse's here this morning, my, my sons, both my sons, we went with, and with my dad, 
we went up to Glenwood on the south side of the river there, up in those hills back up in there above Glenwood. There's a whole bunch of limestone caves. Have any of you ever been up in some of those limestone caves? caves? Well, there are. There's a ton of them. And you can get a guidebook that will um, that will kind of guide you through that. So we did. We got that. And I thought that would be really great. My kids are, you know, my boys are little, and this would be a great experience. Have you guys ever been in a cave before? I mean, it's pretty awesome, right? I mean, when you're in a cave and you, uh, you know, there's just so much that goes on in your mind. Well, I took these guys, and it wasn't like, you know, it was really easy to find. We had to have the guidebook. There weren't signs that were pointing, go to the cave. You know, here's the cave, this way, you know, turn on this road. You know, we had to kind of get there. We finally got to the cave, and here we are. We're down in the cavern of this cave. And, you know, we had our headlamps on. We're looking around. This is really cool. And then I told the boys, let's just switch our head headlamps off headlamps off for a minute and let's just let's just do that do you remember that you remember that? <laughs> when you switch your headlamp off and there's no light in there all of a sudden oppression just hits you the blackness have you ever been in that before have you ever been in that situation where all of a sudden you're just like you, you're feeling the weight of all the tons of earth that are on top of you you know, and you're thinking, and then your thought life goes, right? <laughs> and you're going, dang, I wonder if this is going to fall. I, you know, how many people have ever been in here? I don't know. You, would they ever find me if I was, you know? You know, all this stuff just goes up, and the fear just can really overcome you. Um, it's a great, it, it's a, I think it's a great thing to do, actually. <laughs> uh, because we came out of the cave, obviously. But this is the thing. In the guidebook, there was this one little passage that talked about a special cavern that was there in that cave, and you kind of had to search for it. Well, this cavern, you know, it wasn't really easy to find, and I knew that it was there because of the guidebook. If I had not read the guidebook, I never would have known that that cavern was there. So I read about it, and it was like, you should do that. You should go into that cavern. Well, this is the problem with the cavern. The cavern had an entrance that was probably about this round for about 20 or 30 feet. So you had to wiggle your way through that to get to this place. And so here I am, I'm on, I'm in the cave. Okay, we turn on our lights. You know, the fear had kicked up and all of that. And I'm standing there going, we came into this cave. I, was, I told myself I was gonna do this, right? And so here I am on the edge of that. And I said, well, I'm only gonna be here once. I'm gonna do it. So I started. And I start going down through there, struggling through it, get halfway through, and I'm scared. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I, all those things were going through my mind. Is it real? Has anybody ever been here? Is it still open? You know, all of these kinds of things just go through your mind. Well, finally, I get to the entrance of the cavern, and my light is shining all around up in this cavern. And to my surprise, there's all of these crystals hanging down. It was beautiful. It was awesome. And I'm thinking, how many people have ever seen this before? Nobody's seen it. Hardly anybody has seen this. I mean, it was really a neat kind of thing. So I sat there in the cavern for a while. I sat there just looking, taking it all in, you know, looking at the thing, just thinking about my life, basically, you know. And it was really a neat time for me. But then I heard them out there. And they were like saying, dad, dad, I could just barely hear them through the, this place. Dad, are you there? Are you okay? They had no idea of what I was seeing and experiencing. They had no idea if I was even alive. And my boys were small at that time. Leo's kind of a worry wart, you know? So I'm sure all of this stuff was going, I'm never going to see my dad again. You know, I, I guess, you know, I never thought through that. When I went into that game, I never really thought through, you know, what this was going to do for him, especially because he, he is that way. And I, I, maybe he's scarred for life. I don't know. But I didn't even really think about it. Here, their dad is going into this place and never see him again. You know, who knows? Um, so, you know, all of, those, all of those things, as I remember through that, it's so much like the way life is so often for us. Here we know, and we've got the guidebook, right? We've got it right here. We've got the things that God has told us and the truth of his word right here. And we read over it and we memorize it and we have it here in our heads. But oftentimes it's really hard as we're going through the mundane things. The, well, I don't know what you're doing in your life right now. Um, you know, all of the things that are just day by day going through the motions of it. And it's really easy just to get caught in that and to forget. No, this is the life of Christ, that the life of Christ has been given to me. We find ourselves in this struggle, you know, trying to get through it, you know. 
trying to get through this situation, trying our hardest to do that. And so my hope today is that as we go through these verses, because we've got a lot of them to go through, I'm hoping that you will be encouraged. This is a passage you've probably all read and heard, you know, but I pray that the Lord will do something fresh in your heart this morning and remind you of your, the reality of what Jesus has done. You may not see the totality of it, but the reality of what he has done in your life and how the spirit can apply the truths of these scriptures to your heart, to my heart, to actually live through it and to walk through it and not just get through it, but to really be what, all that he's called us to be. Let's read through that passage right now. It is uh, in, in chapter three, verse one, it says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also with, will appear with him in glory. I mean, this is, we're just going to kind of break down some of the ideas that are in here. And we'll just go as far as we can in this. Um, because we have this truth stated here in this particular, these, these particular verses, right? But all the way through the Bible, we see that there is support for all the things that are said here. And in our Bible study, I mean, it's really great to pull a verse out here and to think about it. But oftentimes there's so much more that is there that just supports that idea. I love that about the word of God. Have you found that true in your life? That when you start to really dig in and you start to really seek it, you know, the Lord shows you all kinds of places where the same truths are really reflected. And that is the beauty of God's word. That's how we can read through this for a lifetime and actually find something different each and every time because we find new instances. We find new ways that it applies to the circumstances of our life. And that's why the word of God, it's not just a book that's written, but it's living, it's powerful, it's active in our lives to give us discernment for the things that we are living in. And then the spirit of God comes along and just brings it to life and, to, and lights it on fire in our hearts. So um, let's just look at this real quick. Uh, Colossians 2.12, we're looking back, you know, this verse really looks back into what Paul has already talked about. And so, you know, verse one is really built on that. When we see here that we were raised with Christ, what well, we you know, to be raised, right? You have to die. There has to be a death to be raised. You have to be down. And so if then, if then you were raised, look what it says here in Colossians 2.12. It says, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You know what? In baptism, we are, uh, we are identifying with the death of Jesus. That's, that's simply what baptism is all about. It's about our identification with his death, that we are dying to our old nature. We're dying to our will, and we are living a life that is resurrected into his will. And we are identifying with that. that, that that's what baptism is. That's, it, it's a declaration. And so it's the declaration that we were buried, that we died with him. Just as he died there on the cross, just as he died to his own will and did what the Father called him to, uh, we do the same thing. Romans 6, uh, 4 through 5 kind of echoes that same idea. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. You know what he has done? We enter into that same kind of an idea that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. I mean, th that, that's amazing. Here we are dying to ourselves, dying to our own will, and yet we are raised up and we're promised. You know, in every situation, in every circumstance, this is the, this is the truth. This is what it is. It should be us realizing that we don't want our will, but we want his will to be done. Um, for we have, it continues to say, for we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So what, G and that's the, that's the awesome thing about the resurrection. It was a proof, right? It was a proof. It was a physical proof of what God can do. 
And that's the power of the resurrection in our life. Because if God can raise up Jesus from the dead out of the tomb, then he can also do the other things that he says. He can raise us up. He can raise us up in the certain circumstances and situations that we're in. He can raise us up when we die. You know, that the la- that death will have no hold on us, but we will rise in the likeness of his resurrection. And, you know, just like we were talking about, um, you know, uh, communion isn't just, you know, it's just not a physical ritual or something like that. Well, it's not just that when we die, we're going to be raised up with him. It's not just a physical thing that he's talking about. He's talking about the spiritual. And that's what really, that's what's really beautiful about this. It's both of those things. We have the promise of that, but we have the actual reality of that. And we can live it spiritually right now. We can live that in our lives right now in the situations and circumstances that we are in as we die to ourself and allow the Lord to do his work through us. This is another really good one. Romans 6, 9 through 11. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So just as Jesus went through that process physically, we will, we will mirror that in our lives. We will mirror that uh, and spiritually. Um, Ephesians 2, 5 through 6 says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing idea, isn't it? I mean, that is really amazing. And this was something, these verses actually were something that really changed my life as a young man. When I was, you know, in college and I had been raised in the church, you know, I had a lot of knowledge. I had a lot of scriptures that I'd memorized through that time. Um, my dad had been a leader at churches. And, uh, you know, there was that religious aspect of my life that I had. But I felt that it was lacking in some ways. You know, I felt like I was just kind of going through the motions. And that's kind of the way it is when, you're, when, when, you're, when your relationship with the Lord is kind of tied to the things that you do. That's, a, that's, a, that's you know... That, that's hard. It's kind of an up and down roller coaster ride. Well, actually, I came to the church here and Jeff was teaching through the book of Ephesians. And that whole idea in the first chapter of in Christ, in Christ, in him, in Christ, in him, in him, that whole section just started to really enter into my heart and into, enter into my mind. And then, you know, in chapter two, we see this, that we're raised up and made us to sit together in the heavenly places. That's past tense, Right? That's past tense. That's the way the Lord sees you. That's the way the Lord sees me. That's the way he sees us in this life, that we are seated with him. We're sitting with him. We're together with him. What happened to him? That process is happening in us. It's awesome. It's really freeing when you really understand the Lord loves you. You are seated with him as a child. If you're born again, you are seated with him. In the heaven, that's how he sees you. That's what he looks at. When God looks down, he sees Jesus and what Jesus did covering over your life as a born-again son or or daughter of God. I mean, that is awesome. That's a game changer. It changes the way that we look at the things of this life. It's the way it changes the way that we look at the circumstances because we realize that we are his and that we are in his hands. He's made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have a place there. And then the next idea that we see here in uh, verse one there of chapter three is seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above. You know, it's easy to talk about that, and it's really, a, it's really easy to say that, and I can read through that, but what does that really mean? When we were in our life group last week, it was like there was a verse that came up. It was similar to this, but it was like, uh, it was that idea of seeking the things that are above, and, and, and the question came up, well, what are the things that are above? 
And we're all kind of sitting there scratching our head. Have you ever been in that place where somebody asks you a question and it's like real obvious, but you're like, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things. What are the things that are above? What are we seeking that is above? Well, I think that there's a, there's a lot of things that we could actually say about that, but there's three things that I want to talk about this morning that really, uh, that, that I see there and they're, they're, they change the way that we look, you know, and the idea here of seeking is not maybe just trying to find something that's lost, you know, and you're going, well, if it'll show up at some point, I know it's somewhere it's, you know, but really it's really the idea of tearing things apart and really actively trying to find that thing. Have you ever been in that case where all of a sudden you realize that something is missing that's important and all you're like, you're like trying to find it in everything, everywhere. There's this earnestness to your, your looking. See, that's what's trying to be communicated here. That's what the, that's what this word communicates is that we are seeking. Um, You know, when we were in Mexico a while back, um, uh, I, <laughs> I realized, and I don't know how I realized this. I can't remember, but I realized that my passport was missing and I'm like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, I'm like, Oh no, that's, that's my identity. That's where I'm, I'm not going to get out of this country <laughs> if they, if I don't have my passport, they, I need this. So I started tearing things apart. I started really looking for that, not just looking for it, but actively doing it. You know, it's not that kind of seeking. And when you get to that place, it's not like this casual thing. No, you're feeling it, right? I mean, this lump in your stomach. I know that something is missing and I have to find that. And I'm not, that feeling doesn't go away until I find that. See, that's the idea here is that kind of a seeking. Well, it, just to close, I didn't close it up in the first um, uh, in the first service. I didn't close it up. Somebody came up to me afterwards. So, did you ever find your pap- passport? I said, "Well, I'm here, <laughs> right?" <laughs> so obviously, I did. But I was looking. You know where it was? It was where I had put it. <laughs> right? <laughs> it was in the backpack that I every time I travel. See, I'd taken it out and I'd taken it with me. And um, when I'm on the plane, I always know where it's at. It's right there in that pocket in my backpack. Well, um, this time around, I had taken it out and I'd done some things with it and I'd left it in a couple other places, but it was right back in the place that I always had kept it. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> but um, uh, so anyway, I was very much relieved. And then there was, okay, so you have that lump in your stomach and it doesn't go away until you find that and all of a sudden you find it and, and, and it's gone and there's just this refreshment that comes from it, you know, whoo, whoo, it's all good, you know, and you're, and you're, and you're experiencing that feeling then. Um, I don't know. Have you experienced that with the Lord? Where you're just really looking for something? You're really looking for him in a certain situation? You're really asking him to do something? See, that's the, our father wants us seeking him. He wants us to be seeking in a way that we're tearing things up to try to understand. Sometimes we have to tear up the things that we've always known or the things that we've always thought. I mean, there's a process there of God peeling back that maybe, you know, the things that we think in order to uncover really what God's will is in that situation. So, so, um, so a couple of things, okay. We're to seek the things that are above. What are, there's three things that I, as I was praying about this, that I really felt like the Lord, um, wanted me to say, you can probably add to it and you should as the spirit leads you that in how, how it works out in your own life. But here's one of them. But seek first, Matthew uh, 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. We're to seek the kingdom of God. That's the primary. We're, we're to seek God's kingdom. And when we think about that, you know, God's kingdom, it's kind of interesting because Sometimes I think we try to take the state that we are in and, you know, the way that man kind of thinks about rulership and all that kind of stuff. We're living in a country that is far different than a kingdom, don't you think? I mean, we have representatives, right, that kind of do the things that we say, (laughs) right? I mean, that's what we think of. We think that we have some kind of control and some kind of freedom there, you know, and, and, you know, there is some of that for sure, but that's far different than a kingdom right? What is a kingdom? A kingdom, there's a king, right? And the king is 
uh, by and large, unapproachable. I mean, that's the reality through history we see that. You just can't walk into the king and say, hey, king, you know, I want this or I want that or, you know, that thing you said the other day. <laughs> I don't agree with that, you know. That's, that's not the way a kingdom works. Another part of the kingdom is that there is a will. A kingdom is a reflection of the will of the king, right? I mean, that's what it is. There's a reflection of the will of the king in the kingdom. And so when we say here that we're seeking the kingdom of God, we are see- we're seeking something that's very different than where we're living right now. Wouldn't you say? So it's one of those things that's above. And so when we think of the things that are above, we kind of tend to think of the things that are up here physically. But really, you know, and that, that may be the case. May- heaven's up there somewhere, you know, we don't really know what's going on there. It's out of our, you know, knowledge, really really those specifics of that. But, you know, the other idea is that spiritually these things are above as well. We know that the kingdom of God, it's something that we're experiencing right now, right? Jesus came and he said, no, the kingdom of God is in the hearts of men. That's where the kingdom of God is. That's where God rules. He rules in the heart of men. And that's what we're experiencing. We will, you know, eventually, we will see the totality of God's rule. We will experience that and we'll be in his presence and we'll be in that kingdom in the presence of the king. But right now we're experiencing that through, a, you know, it, it's a dim glass. We're, we're looking through it. We're seeing that. We know that. But his kingdom is much more than what we see here. And it's different than what we experience. You know, and so we have to be careful. I think we're living in difficult times right now, don't you think? I mean, really, when we when we really look out across the landscape of the world, there are difficult things that have happened in the last couple of years. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how far the world has progressed and gone away, right, from the, the presence of the Lord or the morality of God. I mean, this country, and it's hard for us, really. At times we really struggle with it because we know what this country was and what it has been. It built on a morality. And it was built on God's morality in a lot of ways. I mean, in history, we can see that in, even in our courtrooms, there were scripture that was on the wall. There was the law that was posted up on the law. And people actually kind of lived by that. They may not have been born again, but they lived by that morality. Right now, we're in a place where morality, God's morality, is almost in some ways non-existent, right? I mean, we are in a place that is really... It's difficult. And as Christians, it's hard to know. What are we to do in this time? What are we to do? And so the trap for us often is that we get stuck in the politics or the things of this life. And, you know, and we're kind of railing against those things. In reality, we need to be seeking the kingdom of God. You know, we need to be seeking his kingdom because his kingdom is what is eternal. His kingdom is where we really are citizens. And that's what this verse says. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. I mean, that's just a beautiful passage that reminds us that our citizenship is not here. And that's super frustrating, isn't it? I get it. It's super frustrating to look out over the world and to see what is going on. But we have to be reminded. Um, You know, I used to to listen a lot to talk radio. And I kind of enjoyed that for a time. But I got to the point where it was like it's all humanism. It really is all humanism. Almost all of it. It's all based on if man would just do this, then the world would be a better place. And that's the way the world really runs right now. If we would just have social justice, if we would just do this or give that, or you know, if we would just include this and that and blah, 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 and it goes on and on. It's man's way of trying to emulate what God has done and what he will do, and what he wants to do when people are a part of his kingdom. Man wants some of that stuff, not all of it. 
They want to kind of control it, but it's really easy. And we see the church right now is being pulled apart into these different places, uh, you know, and trying to, you know, be, you know, trying to include, trying to, you know, do the right thing in social justice and all of this. We're seeing all of these ways that the church is trying to conform into that. We need to really keep it simple, right? In your life, in my life, we need to keep it simple. We need to be seeking the kingdom of God first before anything. It should govern the way that we live, the words that we say, you know, the actions of our life. It should govern all of that. The kingdom of God should do that. The second thing that goes along with that is in Matthew 6, 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done as it is uh, on earth, as it is in heaven. You know, that's the other part of this. There's the kingdom, but there's the will of the king, right? And to really live that out, where we are living out the will of God, that our life becomes a conduit, that people actually can see God through the way that we live our lives. So your kingdom come. And I love this. You know, when Jesus was teaching this to the disciples, they were asking, hey, how do we pray? And Jesus says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, he said that, and it was something that he said. It was a teaching, really. And he was showing them an example. But the awesome thing, and the um, and just the really, really, when we read through the Gospels, we should really be amazed at the wonder of what Jesus did, because he's not just a teacher in word, right? He's not just a teacher in word, because he did it, he lived it out, and we see that as I was teaching through Oasis, we were teaching through the the um, the Garden of Gethsemane, and in that we really see Jesus said, "What? Not my will." but your will be done. He didn't just say this. He didn't just say that this is a good thing for you guys to do. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. No, he did it to the point where he, right? He went to the cross and he did the thing that is hard for us to even fathom or understand that he gave himself for a bunch of miserable sinners. And that is the reality of it. And we see that exploding all over the place in our world. Miserable sinners. And yet even he died for those. He died for the world. He gave his life. Whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. Whoever. He didn't come to condemn the world, but the world should be saved through him. It's beautiful because he didn't just say it, he did it. And he's calling us to enter into that place where we're just not saying, Lord, I want to do your will. Show me what your will is in this situation. No, he wants to give us the power and the ability and the heart to really do it. And that's where victory really is at. See, when we look at the cross and we see, he said, it is finished when he was hanging on the cross, right? He died. His spirit left him. He died. It was finished. The work of atonement was finished. But you know what? The victory really was in the garden. That's where the victory was because he surrendered his heart to the Father's will. He surrendered his will to the Father's will. And that's where victory is going to be for us when we surrender our will to the Father's purposes. When we just let go and we allow God to work in and through our life. When we let go of the buts, of the ands, of the ifs, all of that kind of stuff. We let go of that stuff and we allow God's word to Uh, and his will to be done through this mortal body, this mortal flesh that he has given to each and every one of us to glorify him. And you know what? This verse, I mean, this this verse has been thrown around a lot lately in the last few years, right? First Peter, it says, uh, first Peter 2, 13 through 15, but it, but but this is awesome for us to look at here. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. You look at that and you go, oh my gosh, no way. I'm not going to do that. You see what's going on here? God, do you understand what's going on? But look at this. Look at what it says. For this is the will of God. Wow. This is the will of God. This is God's will, that we would have a humble, submitted heart, surrendered to the Lord's purposes. This is the will of God, that 
and this is the this is the real thing that by doing hey i found it bill it's this cord here yep it's this cord every time i walk on it look at that i thought it was my mic last service and i'm going oh you know i'm trying to adjust anyway okay so this is the point this is the point the will of god but it's not just this will that's out there right and we think yeah, I want to do the will of God. It's a, No, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. By living your life. By living according to the kingdom of God. Living your life to the will of God. And having that perspective. Seeking that above all things. It's by doing good. That's how we prove who God is. That's how we prove that he is real. That he is alive. That he has given each man freedom, no matter what the political climate is, no matter what is going on, you know, within a country, you know? I just encourage you guys, encourage myself. It's a hard time to be living, isn't it? I mean, we have a lot of things that are coming up into our lives that are really difficult to know. How do we respond? How do we talk to people? How do we help? God wants to give us the ability to be able to do that as we look for his will in the certain situation. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 4, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. You know, we read that um, and we see that the will of God is for us to be able to, you know, have a body that is used for his glory and not just for what we want to do, not for what we, we think is important, but for his will. And we surrender it. And he, and he, he gives us the example of sexual sin is there for sure. We see that, right? That, I mean, that's, that is just out of control in our world today. I mean, that is just out of control. So God wants us not to align with that, to, but to be set, set apart, sanctified for him to use us Use this body for his glory, not for our own benefit or our own ideas or our own thoughts or the things that we uh, think are important, but for his. And so, um, you know, that is super hard. And one of the frustrating things, you know, living in this society is we can see the truth of what is going on, right? I mean, we see, I mean, because in reality, I mean, good is evil and evil is good right now. Have you noticed that? Have you seen that in the situations and the circumstances, the, the things that we're passing in our government and that is being talked about in the highest places in our country? It's good switching places with evil and evil switching places with good. It is really frustrating. And it's really easy for us to just get angry about it, right? I mean, we can totally just get really angry about that situation. And not know, and, but the, the fact of the matter is, there are people that are stuck in these places. There are people that are stuck in sin. There are people that are stuck in places where they don't even know the basic, who am I? What am I? You know what? The Lord should really be giving us compassion for the world. That's how we are going to show through our good deeds, through how we live, you know, how we respond. You know, that we love and that's not about not telling truth. That's about really having compassion. There's a difference between, you know, just having truth and just saying truth and actually having compassion for people. Have you been in that place where you're actually really loving and yet you're seeking out the will of God? That's where we need to be. We need to be in that place where there's compassion driving us to do what we're supposed to do. That's the way Jesus was. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't love those people. No, he was passionate about them. He, he lived out of He was compassionate. And yet he was compassionate in the midst of what he was saying. And that's, we need that. We need to be able to do that in our life. We need to say that the Lord has given us that ability to just live out of that. The other, the third thing that is one of the things that are of our will that we need to be seeking is his presence. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forever. 
This is what John chapter 17, 21 says. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. There is a pursuit of the presence of God in the life of someone who's born again. We pursue his presence because ultimately that's what changes us. That's what gives us compassion. That's what gives us what we need to really walk through the situations that we're in. Here, think about this. What Jesus said, um, you know, he, he, he um, um, <laughs> you know, when he looked out over the crowd before he turned, uh, you know, when he fed all of them, he had compassion for the people. He had compassion for them. And um, he, 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 he gave them that. And it was because of the presence of the Father within him giving everything that they needed at that time. I mean, it was a beautiful thing that he did there. But he was so connected to the Father and knowing the presence of the Father that he was able to really communicate that compassion to them. And we're going to have that in, in our life as we're near to him. What did they say in Acts? Um, you know, in Acts when they uh, the disciples were in front of the, rule, the religious leaders there and the rulers there? What that they they couldn't they couldn't really um, you know they couldn't believe who they were and what they were saying and what they were doing because they had been with Jesus right they had been in the presence of Jesus and they were changed and that's what's going to happen for us as we are in His presence as we're in His Word as we are in fellowship like we are today in church you know with the people as we're at life group there's going to be that place where we just enter in to his presence and it just comes out of who we are because of the presence of jesus um that is that is just one of those beautiful things so um part of um verse three there is we're to seek those things that are above where christ is sitting at the right hand of god so here we are we're seeking the kingdom of god we're seeking his presence we're seeking his will and then in mark 16 19 it says so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So we see that he was seated in heaven. There are so many verses that talk about him being there, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Um, Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, there's just so many of these passages, but you can see that tied up in, in that, in that sitting down, is the idea of him being, you know, that he uh, is that he has power. And that really is what, uh, you know, you can't just walk up to the king and sit on his throne. You can't just walk up and sit beside the king on his throne. You know, there, it, this communicates that he's a, he has authority, that he has power. And um, all of these verses really show us that side of that. He has gone up, First Peter 3, 22 says, who has gone up into heaven and it is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth. You know what? He has that authority. He is not just, um, you know, the savior mediator, but he is the king. He is the king and he has that power. And you know what? He's indwelling in us. You know, the way that we live our lives, there is the indwelling presence of Jesus. And through the power of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we, we are reminded of his word, of his presence with us. And so we have been given just that beautiful gift of what he has done for us in being raised up with him. Um, what does he do there as he's sit, sitting at the right hand of the Father? Romans 8 gives us a clue. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who even at the right hand of God, who is 
even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. What's he doing there? He's interceding for us. He's there sitting in heaven. He's interceding for you and for me in the situations that we find ourselves in. You know, the king of heaven is there interceding for us. So that, that you know, that's a thought and that's a reality that really can, um, you know, it can really encourage us in the midst of the difficult things that we are going through, that he is interceding for us. And as I was thinking about that and, um, you know, because the throne room of God, the picture of that that we have in the Old Testament of the throne room of God, it is the Holy of Holies, that room there where the, uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant was, the mercy seat was there. Once a year, the high priest would go in and would anoint the mercy seat with, with um, you know, the blood of a lamb that was sacrificed for the nation of Israel. Well, in that we see a beautiful picture of Jesus and the blood of Jesus sitting there at that place of authority where God is seated always, continually, for eternity. He is sitting there and he is a reminder to the world for eternity that he is that sacrifice, that the only sacrifice that can pay for sin, that can bring us into fellowship with the Lord. So, I mean, it is a beautiful place that we have been given in the Lord that we are able to be raised up into this. So we seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And then it goes on to say that we're to set our minds on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And we don't have time to go through all the scriptures that I have that really solidify that, those things that are there. But we have that hope. Here we are in the reality of this life, in the things of this life. And yet, you know, someday we are going to be in the presence of God and we're going to see the totality of what has actually been accomplished through what Jesus did there at the cross. Let's pray. Lord, we just really thank you for this time that we've had together this morning. We thank you for how you have done everything that we need to be in your presence. Lord, we thank you that for your word that gives us just life and that gives us a view of life, that we can know who we are in you. We don't have to struggle with, um, with the ups and downs of the situations and the feelings that we go through in life, but we can have that solid and beautiful hope of your presence and the resurrection of your life. And so I just pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning. I thank you for each one that's here, that we would be encouraged, that we would walk in not just um, the, re the knowledge of that, but really in the reality and the power of that. And we know that as we seek you, that we grow in the reality of who you are and the reality of the resurrection. And so, Lord, we just want to continue to walk on that road of growing in you. And I just thank you so much for each one that's here. What a blessing it is to be able to fellowship together and to have these truths and hold these truths together as your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you just stand with us as we close in this last song? It's on your heart.